Another thing that he uh, arrogates to the city, in addition to this question of, um, of censorship, is the idea of what we might call the noble lie. At 389 uh, B and C, he says, truth is another thing we must value highly. If lies really are useless to the gods and useful to men only in the way medicine is useful, then clearly lying is a task to be entrusted to specialists. Think about those words for a moment. Since the gods know everything, the gods are aware of what's true and what's not true, lying serves no greater purpose. The reason you lie is not for the gods, you lie for other people, right? So therefore, it's a skill, like medicine. Therefore, if it's a skill, who should practice it? Those who are skillful at it. Lying is a skill. Then clearly, lying is a task to be entrusted to specialists. Ordinary people should have nothing to do with it. So if anyone is entitled to tell lies, he continues, Who is it? Who is entitled to tell lies in the ideal city? The rulers of the city. They may do so for the benefit of the city in response to the actions either of enemies or of citizens. No one else should have anything to do with lying, and for an ordinary citizen to lie to these rulers of ours is as big a mistake. We institute falsehood, deception, as part of the necessary art of rule, But then we create a monopoly of deception amongst the ruling class. Only those who govern us have the right to lie. The rest of us are compelled to to an honesty. And if we are caught lying, there will be consequences. But for the rulers, they have the capacity to lie to us. Why are they allowed to lie to us? What does that suggest? First of all, do you think people lie to us in our existing political society? Do you think we're told lies all the time? Do people lie to us because we just elect lying liars who love to lie because they like to lie their way through a lying life? Is that why they lie to us? Why do they tell us lies? Isn't it like that old Jack Nicholson phrase, right? You can't handle the truth. Therefore, since you can't handle the truth, I will tell you a lie. They shape a world that we want to see because if they were not to do it that way, it would be difficult, right? The circumstance the circumstances would be, would be difficult. So in a sense, that's why we call it the noble lie. That's the phrase for it, and you'll see it in political science and political theory, the idea of the noble lie. A lie told for noble reasons, a lie told for the social good in that sense. And so he says, in a city of this kind, we grant to our rulers the capacity to lie, but we recognize that they have the skill of lying. And the interesting thing of of this is, we can see it in action at 413C. We can contrive to use one of those necessary lies we were talking about a little while back. We want one single grand lie which will be believed by everybody, including the rulers ideally, but failing that, the rest of the city. And the lie you need to tell is a lie that explains why people are who they are inside the city. He says at 414D, I have to try to persuade, first of all, the rulers themselves and the soldiers, and then the rest of the city, that the entire upbringing and education we gave them, and remember, it's your upbringing and education that creates the guardian class, right? Or creates the, 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 the craftsman, or creates the field worker, or whatever. So in other words, you've created people through their education. But now you have to tell them this lie, that uh, we have to persuade them that the entire upbringing and education we gave them, their whole experience of it happening to them was merely a dream, something they imagined. And that in reality, they spent that time being formed and raised deep within the earth. Themselves, their weapons, and the rest of their equipment, which was made for them. What is he saying here? It's a very bizarre statement. Suddenly there you are, you are a guardian, or you are an agricultural worker, you're a craftsman, you know how to do this, you know how to do that. The question is, how do I know how to do this? Why am I this person and not that other person? What produced me in this way and not another way? And the answer is, because we crafted a system to make you into that. By selecting for certain qualities, some shall be this, some shall be that, and some shall be the other. We used education to create the citizens that we need. But we don't want people to feel that they are that they've been created in this way. We don't want people to feel that they are the product of an education or an upbringing. We want people to feel differently. We want people to feel as if they were made that way. The reason I am a guardian is 
I am, was born a guardian. I'm destined to be a guardian. The reason I am a craftsman is this is who I am. So he says, the story that we will tell is as follows. You are all brothers, our story will tell them. All of you in the city. All, everyone in the city is connected. You are all brothers. And let's, for the purpose of this class, be a little bit more inclusive and say, and sisters as well. But when God made you, he used a mixture of gold in the creation of those of you he thought were fit to be rulers, which is why they are the most valuable. He used silver for those who were to be auxiliaries and iron and bronze for the farmers and the rest of the skilled workers. Most of the time you will father children of the same type as yourselves, but because you are all related, occasionally a silver child may be born from a golden parent or a golden child from a silver parent, and likewise, any type from any other type. What an extraordinary passage. What is he essentially saying? We have these three things. We have gold, silver, and bronze, then as now, first, second, and third. Some of you were born first rate. Some of you are born second rate, and some of you are born third rate. Now, is that true? Remember, this is not true. What is it? Is a lie told by the state. The rulers tell the lie because it is in the interests of society. So we build up this system of classes in the interests of what is good for the city. And therefore, those who are of golden character are the guardians, the rulers. Those who are of silver character perform these useful functions and everybody else is, is bronze, right? The rest, of, the rest of people. Fair enough, that sounds pretty nasty. It means that by, just simply by dint of birth, you are locked into one of these class categories. Because that's what it is. It is a theory, if you will, of class. And the interesting thing is, in this ideal city, we have to construct class. It's a kind of provocative notion. There is the recognition that class doesn't exist as a function of nature. It exists as a function of what? Education and upbringing. I can take the same infant, and by virtue of the education and upbringing that I give to her, I can either produce someone of gold, silver, or bronze quality. And so all the distinctions between us as a function of class are uh, a, a fabrication of the mechanisms that we have in our society to create people. But that's not what people want to think of themselves. What do they want to think? I'm better than the rest of these people. I'm a golden boy, right? Or sucks that I was born bronze, but there we go, I'll have another beer. Right? That's what we want people. We want people to sort of assimilate into themselves this sense of who they are. Which, if you're gold, is great. And if you're bronze, kind of sucks. So what's the escape mechanism? How do you give the bronze person some sense of hope, of meaning? We embed a principle of social mobility inside of not our society, because after all, remember, the society, the rulers, the guardians are selecting constantly the best people to, fu to fill the best functions. Instead, we embed inside of our falsehood, our lie, that there is this mechanism of social mobility. So it's part of the lie that we tell people. If the selection mechanism is energetic, swift, wise, and so on and so forth, those characteristics might be found in anybody. So the reality is that if you have the selection mechanism in which you're trying to recognize the virtues that people have and nurture them through an education system in order that they may fulfill their role in the city in the best possible way, of course you're going to have a, a constant blending. But what this is doing is it's essentially classifying that, if you will, that system across a, a dynamic that people can understand. People can't understand very easily this notion of an excellence of the soul that makes you into one or another. But they can understand class. A simple three-class system. Upper class, middle class, lower class. It seems to be a very universal thing. And so therefore, even in the ideal city, as part of the noble lie that you tell, you recreate, if you will, this mechanism for comprehension so that people can understand themselves according to a class-driven society. Think about this then. First of all, controlling the information that people get to hear. So we've embedded a principle of censorship inside the city because we've determined that the things that people hear have an outcome in terms of how they think, how they understand the world. So therefore, we need to control what they hear. Secondly, we have a system of education that essentially is capable of producing different kinds of people. Some people are produced into one class, some people are produced into another class, and so the state has this mechanism which allows it essentially to select the outcomes for people. And finally, we've given the capacity, we've given the power of our rulers to lie. 
right, to shape the world that we live in because they can define for us what we hear, what we don't hear, right? They, can, they are allowed to lie to us and tell us stories so that for those who are living in this city, you might well believe you are the product of some, man, some divine manufacturer using some blend of gold, uh, silver, bronze, and iron. And so that explains who you are, not this sort of larger mechanism. Based on all that, who are you going to want to rule the city? And let's rephrase the question first. Who is the absolute worst person, or worst, what's the worst possible system for ruling your city under a system like that? Democracy, the mass, right? Because by definition, the mass makes no discrimination about judgment. It's simply the mass of everybody coming together and doing what masses always do, which is essentially making a chaotic mess of things through the exercise of mass judgment. So the worst possible form of government is a government in which the uninformed make decisions, the mass. What's the alternative? What's the, if you will, the exact opposite of the mass? What's like democracy raised to the power of negative one? We might say, if the mass represents a kind of general ignorance, what you're looking for then is some kind of specific or focused wisdom. So you want to move a decision away, decision making away from large numbers of people whose judgment can't be trusted, and instead you need to move power into the hands of a small number of people whose judgment absolutely can be trusted. And so there, if you ask, well, who is the most strong, wise, energetic, etc., right? In other words, if you've got these qualities within the guardian class, and of the qualities that they have that wisdom is the greatest, who are the wisest among us? What do we call them? We call them the philosophers. And so from this observation, there is, if you will, a subset of the guardians, right? A small group of people, those who within the guardian class who already represent the best in society, who have certain characteristics which make them stand out even from the other guardians, chief among them being this capacity for wisdom. Wisdom meaning, in this sense, not only knowledge, but judgment, right? Judgment, understanding. And so, based on that capacity to judge, to understand, leveraging knowledge, they are the ones in whose hands we should concentrate or place the principle of rule. They are what he calls the philosopher kings. That's our ideal state will be governed by philosopher kings. Let's go back to something that we saw in one of the earlier texts. Remember, I think it's in the Apology. Who is the person who rules best? It is not the person who seeks to have power. It is the person who accepts power because they know that if they don't rule, someone else worse than them will rule. It is a model of reluctant power, a model of reluctant rule. As he says in the Republic, no philosopher, no lover of wisdom would be interested in ruling because it will take them away from that which they love most, which is being wise, accumulating knowledge, and essentially diverting their energies into this bureaucratic task. So they will be reluctant to take up this. But in a way, it's that quality of reluctance that then makes them so ideally suited, as he puts it, to ruling the city. If you have people that you truly trust, if you have people who truly demonstrate these characteristics of judgment and wisdom, at that point, all these problematic categories, censorship and class construction, uh, and trusting education to the state and the like, all of those become rather less problematic. If you trust in the nature of the administrative apparatus over the state, then the limits that that apparatus creates for the citizen no longer appear to be particularly problematic. If we go back and look at the great change in the 19th century when education, as I'm saying, re-secularizes away from the church and then back into the hands of the state, one of the things that that suggests in order for people to sort of be willing to entrust the education of their children into the, into the hands of the state is that the state has to then claim some of the authority that had previously been captured by the church. Because if the state didn't have that authority, would you want them defining who your children become? So even though we don't live in our own society in a world of philosopher kings, if you think about it, the principle that's articulated, the principle of a state apparatus guided by good judgment and wisdom still must be operative insofar as we are willing to arrogate or to allow the state to arrogate these functions that then have critical influence in terms of defining who we end up being. 
no not least in the education of our children, our most important, important thing. And so this idea of philosopher kings, the idea then is that once you've established this principle that rule is in the hands of those who are truly wise, then in fact all these other principles can follow because then you have this principle at the top that wisdom is essentially defining the way in which the state works. Let me finish with one final point that's also important to this because essentially what we've done is we've created inside the city, and this is the platonic sort of system that we've got, We've created outwardly in the city a dynamic that reflects inwardly who is the person, at least according to the sort of ancient Greek understanding of it generally, and the Platonic model specifically. Some of you may have heard of the so-called tripartite division of the Platonic soul. If you haven't, you certainly have now. And by the way, that's a great phrase to memorize. The tripartite division of the Platonic soul makes you sound smart will help you succeed with uh, your dates next time you're out having a nice romantic dinner. You throw that into the conversation, going to make the rest of the evening a lot more pleasant. Uh, it also will allow you to justify to your parents the enormous tuition that you're paying because you can go home and say, look how smart I am. Tripartite division of the platonic soul. Eat that, bitch! So there you go. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you're getting in this class. Don't say that it doesn't have a useful value. The tripartite division of the platonic soul is the idea that we each as human beings in our soul, meaning in our internal being, are being pushed and pulled by these competing forces. And the question then is, or the idea is that we then must be the balance of those forces. Tumos, Logos, and Eros are the three constituent elements of the soul. And broadly, they are, so Logos is our is wisdom, right, or reason. Eros, no. our love. And Tumos, you might define as our energies or our appetite. So it's the things that, it's our lusts, our loves, uh, our reason, and so on. And we, in other words, are trapped between these three elements. And the idea then is that if we let either our appetites uh, or our desires become too strong, we will commit actions that appear to be irrational or foolhardy. What is it that constrains the tumos and the eros, right? Our appetites, our desires. What is it that serves as a restraint? It is logos. He has the metaphor of the charioteer in which he imagines a chariot where these wild horses are carrying the chariot. The wild horses represent our desires and our appetites and so on. The role of the charioteer is to steer the horses, to bring them under control. The charioteer operates as logos, as reason. And effectively what we've done is we've created something of the same kind inside of our city. We've recognized that in a luxurious city, a city of loves, a city of lusts, a city of appetites, that there is this potential in that city for chaos and disorder. Therefore, in order to control our fevered city, to make it healthy again, what principle do we need to raise above all others in order to maintain control in our city? And the answer is logos. We want to emphasize the principle of wisdom, right? the principle of reason inside of our city so that the appetites that exist within the city do not take us to places that we do not want to go or that are not good for us. And in this way, one of the things that Socrates tells us as part of this thinking through the problem is we turn our city away then from an inflamed city, from a, a fever city, into what he calls the healthy city at 399E. He says, a city stripped of luxuries, a city that is returned back to a healthy state, which brings him eventually, even at 527C, to describe his city ultimately this kind of ideally imagined this ideally imagined polity as a Calipolis, as a city of beauty, as a, beautiful, as a beautiful city. And the reason it's a beautiful city is because the Calipolis represents not the luxurious city where our appetites and desires are out of control, but now that we've instituted this model of power, a balance of appetites, desires, and emotions with reason, where reason is then personified by the philosopher kings, by this special subset of the guardian of the, the guardian class. So to conclude, if we can then, in construction of this ideal city, imagine, since we're going from the ground up, some principle of power that in which we have confidence that it will act always wisely, then we can grant to that power all kinds of things that otherwise we would be hesitant to grant. 
We would not want to grant in a democracy the principles of the noble lie or censorship or deciding what it is or it is not that we are able to hear or know or things like that. But if you had, in some theoretical world, entire confidence in the ruling authority over you, then in fact those are the kinds of things that we would be willing to grant. Because actually we can see that when they are well exercised, they can save us from the kinds of poor judgment that we are liable to uh, make for ourselves. And so this is essentially what, what Socrates wants to do for us in constructing this ideal city. One of the questions that that raises is, and we'll come back to this when we see this again on Wednesday, is, is this simply an exercise in fruitless utopianism? Could you imagine a city being constituted where a bunch of philosophers are granted power to be able to make these kinds of decisions over us? Does Socrates himself intend this as a utopian thought experiment, and if so, why? Or does he actually see some of these principles laid out in the Republic as actually having some kind of political resonance. In other words, serving as a blueprint for, if not exactly a Socratic Republic, then having some kind of meaning in a larger political sense. And so that's the question we'll come back to when we conclude our discussion on the Republic on Wednesday. So I'll see you guys, I'll see you guys then.